Hi everybody, this is the talk on MRI of muscle signal. We will talk about normal muscle structure, normal muscle MRI signal, causes of muscle signal abnormality, and how to approach muscle signal abnormality. A few technical considerations to keep in mind. We can do fast spin echo versus spin echo sequences and T2 fat suppressed versus stir images. The fast spin echo and stir images are faster. The T2 fat suppressed images should be used for mass-like lesions and stir images are preferable when you're looking at angle structures such as the bent elbow or the ankle because you get more uniform fat suppression. The field of view should be expanded to include both extremities or a comparative side if possible so that you can compare whether there is signal abnormality. Um, we should do a T1 weighted image to look for fatty infiltration and we should do a fluid sensitive fat suppressed sequence which could be T2 fat suppressed or inversion recovery to look for edema. Contrast may be used in cases where one is trying to differentiate a mass versus a hematoma, a cyst versus a myxoma, or looking for areas of necrosis. Now, what is normal muscle on MRI? We contrast it with fat and fluid. So if we think about a T1 weighted images, fat is bright, fluid tends to be slightly dark, and muscle sits somewhere in between the two. If we look at T2 weighted images, both fat and fluid are bright and muscle is slightly darker. And if we look at fluid sensitive fat suppressed sequences, then fat is dark, fluid is bright, and the muscle sits somewhere in between. So between the T1 and the fluid sensitive fat suppressed images, essentially one is a negative of the other, or there is inversion of both, and muscle remains sort of relatively gray throughout. Now, what is a muscle structure? There's a skeletal muscle. The skeletal muscle is surrounded by epimysium, and then it has multiple muscle fascicles within it. Each muscle fascicle um, is then surrounded by the uh, perimysium. Uh, it's got muscle fibers within, um, and then there's got uh, an endomysium. And then within the muscle fiber, there's the sarcolemma. Now, this microstructure is not going to be seen typically on your MRI images. So how do we approach muscle signal abnormality? We look for the abnormality and we try to describe this. Is this edema, fat, or something else? We look for the intramuscular distribution, whether it is focal, diffuse, central, or peripheral. We look for the regionality, whether it is single, random, compartmental, myotomal, or diffuse. And then we look for other clues. So let's take a look at how muscle signal can change. Um, if we think about muscle signal, we can think about edema. Edema is just diffuse T2 signal hyperintensity, which is best demonstrated on fluid sensitive fat suppressed images. And you can have this from myositis, injury, radiation, denervation, compartment syndrome, exercise, or other idiopathic lesions. You can also have a mass like abnormality with edema when you have rhabdomyolysis, tumors, and myositis ossificans. You can have fatty infiltration, which typically happens with denervation, atrophy, disuse, steroids, and hemangiomas. And this is typically what you would see. You would see a T1, T2 hyperintense signal within the muscle, which then also remains dark on the fluid sensitive fat suppressed images. And the third kind of abnormality you can have is a mass like lesion, which is a tumor, focal myositis, myonecrosis, rhabdomyolysis, hematoma, and so on and so forth. If we try to think about intramuscular distribution of muscle signal change, we can have focal abnormality, or we can have diffuse muscle edema that involves the entire muscle. We can have it centrally located, such as in a long muscle where it is along the myotendinous junction, or you can have it peripherally located along the fascial planes. If we think about the regional distribution, it can be involving a single or random muscle. It can involve a compartment. So here you can see that it is mainly this uh, peroneal compartment that is involved where the posterior compartment is spared. You can have it where it is myotomal, so like in this case where you have an, a ganglion cyst in the spinal glenoid notch, the supraspinatus is spared, and it's just the infraspinatus that shows edema. Or you can have it diffusely involving all the muscles. So understanding this is also important. Last but not least, we look for if there's something else. Could there be necrosis? Could there be calcification? Could there be a mass or could there be a hematoma? So to summarize this, when we are going to start looking at muscle abnormalities, we're going to look for the abnormality. Is it edema, fat or something else? 
We're going to look at the intramuscular distribution. Is it focal, diffuse, central, or peripheral? We're going to look at the regionality. Is it a single muscle or a random muscle that is involved? Is it a compartment that's involved? Is it a myotome that's involved? Or is it rather diffuse involvement? And then we will look for other clues. So let's just move on to looking at a few cases to get our, um, uh, our head wrapped around looking at muscle edema. So let's think about this case and we'll follow our standard approach. So if we think about the abnormality here, it's quite evident that there is fairly diffuse muscle edema. So the abnormality is edema. If we think about the intramuscular di distribution, it is fairly diffusely involving the entire muscle. If we think about the regionality, it's involving all of the muscles all across. And if we think about any other clues, we look a bit carefully, you can see a little bit of edema in the subcutaneous tissues here. So there is possible skin involvement. So you have diffuse muscle involvement and diffuse skin involvement, which makes it reasonably obvious that this is a case of dermatomyositis. Uh, let's look at another case. Now here again, you have a case where you can see again, there's some increased signal within the muscle on these fluid sensitive fat suppressed images. So the abnormality is edema. If we look a little bit more carefully at the intramuscular distribution of this, um, what we will start to see is that you can see that the increased signal is primarily along the peripheral margins of the muscle. So this is more of a peripheral distribution of edema. If you look at its regionality, it involves almost all the muscles. Um, and if we think about some other clues, we say that is there actually fascial involvement given that this is perifascial? Is the edema within the muscle or is it actually in the fascia? So if you put all of this together, this is more like a myofascial uh, syndrome, and this would be something like eosinophilic fasciitis. Now, when we think about myositis, obviously there is a fairly comprehensive uh, list of causes for myositis. And uh, this uh, article from the AGR in 2009 is quite um, ex exhaustive in giving you reasons for this. Let's move on to another case. Here again, we have a case with edema. So the abnormality is primarily edema. The intramuscular distribution is rather diffuse. It's not really being, there is some peripheral, you know, intermuscular fluid here, but there's also diffuse edema within the muscles. If you think about its regionality, it seems to be more compartmental. It's this anterior compartment that's really involved. This posterior compartment is fairly minimal, but it's more along this anterior compartment that there is involvement. Um, we also see that there's sparing of the gastrocnemius compartment here. So you have spared compartment. So if you have one compartment involved, other compartments less involved, this makes you think of a compartment syndrome. Moving on to another case of edema. Here you can see there is fairly discrete linear edema bilaterally. So we have edema. If we look at the cross-sectional image, we see that it is more central. It is centered around the myotendinous junction. So it's central. In this case, it is bilateral uh, involvement, so it, but it is isolated. And uh, it is sort of longitudinally along the myotendinous junction. So this would be a typical of a, example of a grade two muscle strain. And this is what we call the myotendinous pattern. So that injury is along the myotendinous junction. Let's contrast this with another case here where you can see that there is similar linear edema but as opposed to the last case where the edema was along the myotendinous junction, here you can see that the edema is along the myofascial junction. So we have edema, we have an in peripheral distribution of the edema. It is again isolated and unilateral. And here it is again along the muscle tendon junction. So along the muscle and uh, you know, myofascial junction. And so this is a grade two muscle strain, but this is of the epimyceal pattern. So this is where the injury is along the muscle fascial junction as opposed to along the muscle tendon junction. Now let's look at again this case of edema. So here again the abnormality is that you have muscle edema. The muscle edema is sort of hazy and bilateral. So it is sort of central in distribution along the myotendinous junction if you will a little bit on both sides. Um, it's sort of diffuse or compartment we're not sure it's involving both compartments posteriorly. Um, and this was somebody who had post exercise pain and these images were obtained at 48 hours after. So if you have somebody who has pain 48 hours after exercise and you have this kind of edema, 
You may see this kind of edema in somebody who is immediately post-exercise or even delayed post-exercise without symptoms. But if they do have symptoms and they do have significant pain after that, then we start to consider this as a condition called delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS. This is an example of DOMS. Let's keep moving on to this case. Um, showed you an example of this earlier on. So here again, the abnormality is primarily edema. You can see this edema here. This is the shoulder. So this is the glenoid, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. And you can see quite clearly how this infraspinatus muscle is more hyperintense than the remaining muscles. You also notice this little blob of uh, bright T2 signal here. So we have edema. It is diffusely involving the muscle, but it is involving a single muscle. And when we see this, we also notice that there is a paralabral cyst. Now we know that this paralabral cyst sits in the spinoglenoid notch. The spinoglenoid notch is where the suprascapular nerve traverses through after it has given a branch to the supraspinatus nerve. Therefore, there's only the innervation of the infraspinatus that remains. And with that innervation of the infraspinatus or with that paralabral cyst compressing upon the nerve, there are denervation related edematous changes within that infraspinatus muscle. As this condition would progress, what one might end up seeing in a case, uh, in some cases is teres minor atrophy. Um, and an anterior minor atrophy is something we see fairly commonly in patients with shoulder problems or even without pro shoulder problems even. Um, and it may be due to an incipient axillary nerve stretch that that happens. So again, when you think about denervation edema, remember it can be in an acute phase where you see muscle edema or in a chronic phase where you start to see muscle atrophy. So this is fatty infiltration. All right. Moving on to this next case here again, you see diffuse muscle edema involving the supra and infraspinatus. So you can see that there's edema. It's diffusely involving the muscles. It's myotomal. These are two nerves that are combined, that are supplied by the, these are two muscles that are supplied by the same nerve. We don't see any discrete um, muscle or, or, or lesion along the nerve in this distal portion. So you have diffuse edema in a myotomal distribution without a focal lesion in that particular area. And then this would make one think that this is a neuropathy that is causing this. So something like a Parsonage Turner syndrome, um, where you have affectation of the more proximal nerves or you have neuritis involving the suprascapular nerve rather than a discrete lesion. Contrast this with another case where you can see again, diffuse shoulder muscle edema involving in this case, um, diffusely the muscles, but all the muscles is involving the supra infraspinatus, all the muscles of the upper extremity, and it is bilateral. So when you have this bilateral edema um, in this situation, uh, then one thinks of more likely to be something like a diffuse neuropathic event. Um, and this was bilateral Parsonage Turner syndrome from um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis related neuritis. So again, you see diffuse muscle edema affecting multiple muscles um, involving an entire extremity start to think of a more proximal cause for denervation. Now let's move from all those cases of edema to cases of fat. So here we have a case when you can see this muscle here, this is the intraspinatus. You can see that it has got, uh, you know, as we compare to the teres minor here, you can see it's much brighter. Um, it's got a few streaks of muscle tissue, but mostly fat. If we look at the corresponding image here, you can see that there is dark tissue over here. So the abnormality is a little bit of fat and a little bit of edema. It is rather diffuse. It does involve a single muscle. And what you look a little bit more carefully and you realize here is that there is a tear of that infraspinatus muscle, maybe even a bony avulsion here. Um, and so this is an example of post tear edema and atrophy of the muscle. Moving on to another case. <clears throat> Here you can see that the lower thigh musculature is completely fatty infiltrated. There's no muscle. This is just tendon over here. Uh, the calf musculature looks quite intact in this case. So here you have an abnormality of fatty infiltration of muscle, which is very diffuse, which is involving a particular myotomal segment, which is the lower thigh. Um, and it has been long standing in this case. And so this is an example of denervation from poliomyelitis. Moving from cases of um, fatty infiltration to cases where we have other things, let's start looking at some of these cases. So here is a case 
where you have something more. So here you have high signal on T1, T2, and T2 fat suppressed images. Um, the intramuscular distribution is focal. It's not really involving the diffuse muscle. And it is sort of in the regional component, it's single, it is more peripheral. It's not really along the central component. It's not along the peripheral aspect. It's sort of a very random location in the muscle. Um, the fact that it is bright on T1 makes you start to think that there is something proteinaceous within this, possibly hemorrhage. And this is an example of an intramuscular hematoma. Now, this could be associated with a tumor or a lesion like that. And this is a case where one might occasionally give intravenous contrast or follow it up to make sure that it's resolving. Um, in this particular case, we knew the patient had a known history of trauma and we just followed it out to resolution. Let's look at another case here. Here you have a case on this T2 fat suppressed image where you can see this bright, uh, you know, you can see these areas uh, that are bright on T1 weighted images. On T2 weighted images, you see these sort of heterogeneous uh, coalescing areas here. And then on the fluid sensitive fat suppressed images, you see sort of cystic areas which are like fluid in here. So here you have a primary abnormality of muscle edema. It is sort of diffusely involving the muscle. It is involving a single muscle group. Um, it shows liquefied areas. And when you say liquefaction within muscle, you start to think about pyonecrosis. And so this is an example of pyonecrosis. Now, here's another case. We start to look at this a little bit more carefully. We can see that there is diffuse muscle edema. The diffuse muscle edema is uh, sort of involving the entire muscle. It's not involving one particular area or the other. It's involving a single muscle. And when we look a little bit more carefully within it, it's not just diffuse muscle edema, but you see this slightly more heterogeneous, irregular area within this. Uh, on T2 and T1 weighted images, it starts to show you some heterogeneous dark areas within this. And we look at a CT image, you see that there's calcification within this. Um, so if you have intramuscular calcification with extensive edema, then you want to think about myositis ossificans. And this is what this is an example of. Um, another example of a case here, here you can see again, there's abnormality is diffuse muscle edema here in the gluteal musculature. It is rather diffuse, but when we look at it a little bit more carefully, it's obviously involving that single muscle. Um, and when we see it a little bit more carefully, we can almost see that everything is centering to this one area here. And when you see things centering to one particular area, it's important to look carefully at that area that it's centering to. And this ended up being an area of calcific periarthritis at the ischial tuberosity, which everything was centering to. And so this is an example of extensive muscle edema as a result of calcific periarthritis. So what have we done in the last um, uh, 20 minutes or so is we have tried to look at what is abnormal. We have tried to understand what is normal muscle signal. We've tried to understand the abnormalities of muscle uh, signal, whether it is edema, whether it is fatty infiltration or something else. We've determined the intramuscular distribution of this, if it is diffusely involving the entire muscle or it's focally involving it. Um, if it is central around the myotendinous junction or peripheral along the myofascial junction. And then we've talked about it being in random locations. We've talked about regional involvement in terms of how many muscles are involved. Is it just a single muscle or is it uh, a group of muscles? If it is a group of muscles, is it a group of muscles that can be grouped by the compartment that they're in? Is it a group of muscles that have the same innervation pattern or is it a group of muscles that is just diffusely involving an extremity or is it a group of muscles that's involving the entire body? And then we've looked at the presence of something else and the something else things can be very helpful, such as masses and hematomas, liquefaction and abscesses, and then intramuscular calcium versus periarticular calcium. So whenever you're thinking about muscle edema, you're thinking about muscle injury, Think about a few of these things. Um, think about what the abnormal, abnormal signal is. Think about um, where it lies within the muscle. Think about which muscles are involved and what connects those muscles that are involved. And then look for something else within it. Um, these are two good references that you can use to look up and review uh, muscle uh, MR imaging. You can check us out for more videos on this YouTube channel. Uh, you can also look at new stuff that's coming out and follow us on Instagram. And then we have our teaching courses at uh, learn.innovisionimaging.com.
um, where you can sign up and learn how to read MRI. Thank you very much.